All right. Uh, the Lockheed Burbank aircraft plant was a top secret plant, uh, plant factory that was building aircrafts. Uh, it was in, it was near Los Angeles and uh, the American government felt the need to hide the factory um, for fear that the Japanese would attack would bomb the West Coast and the, the bombing targets would obviously be um, factories that were producing weapons and producing airplanes and tanks and things like that. So they felt the need to camouflage it. So here's some uh, pictures of, of the plant. You could see here where the uh, airport is, where the airplanes were produced and then they could fly off and, and take them different places. But this entire complex right here is the factory where they would build these airplanes. And uh, there it is uh, with camouflage. You can't even tell. So here's the previous picture there. And in all this area right here, they used netting um, and, and they camouflaged it. So that's what it looked like. And a closer look, you could see uh, within the, the plant area, you could see the top up here, the netting uh, to hide everything. And you could see there too, um, from the from the sky. If you're an airplane going over, this looks flat. You can't tell. Like this is the pitch of a roof. Um, what they did is they planted. They didn't plant. They had these are all fake trees that are that are put there, um, and they made so it made it look like it's flat ground. So from the sky, that's what it looked like. This is all fake. This is all netting right here on the roofs. And there, there's a picture from a roof right here. You could see these poles right here are actually holding up these fake trees. And this is all netting. That's where they would park the cars. And there you have the airplane being built right there. That You could see numerous airplanes here being built under the cover of the net. Anyway, so uh, yeah, so uh, the reason that that uh, they had the the Americans had to had to ramp up their production was because of this. This was a, a huge reason why. You look at this map right here, and it's dominated by red. Red represents the Axis powers. The, well, really, for the most part, Germany at this point, also Italy, but Germany was the one doing most of the damage. Hitler was finding success everywhere in Europe, and he even got into North Africa on his way to taking the Suez Canal to get to the Middle East where he had oil reserves, rich oil reserves that he could use to fuel his, his building army. Um, so yeah, that was, that was his original plan was to go take this territory and work his way east toward, toward the Middle East. But you could just see how much domination that there is there. You, you see that uh, Switzerland is a neutral country. They can be neutral because they have the mountains around it and it's very difficult to attack. So they remain neutral, but uh, all this area taken over by the Germans, that's German domination. And that's the reason why Americans were very concerned because they knew that Great Britain had, was, was going at it alone. And if Great Britain fell, we would be the one that would be next on the list of countries probably to take over. Um, by Hitler. It was, a, it was a legit fear in the United States at the time. Everybody knew that this was coming, the Battle of Britain. That every, that Hitler had taken almost, you look at that and you see he's taken over almost everything. And he basically has Spain in his back pocket because of Franco. Um, but he had not yet ventured into that territory yet because he's allied with him. Uh, but you've got England here just by themselves. And uh, you know, the, everybody knew that that was the next country to be attacked and uh, the Battle of Britain will rage. And it was in August of 1940 um, when the, the, the attack happened, but Hitler made a decision and it, it becomes really his first major uh, mistake in the war. He decided that he was going to try to win this war in the air. He was going to use his Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, to try to, to get uh, Great Britain to surrender. He figured he'd be able to do it. The other reason he did this is because he was, you know, too thin, his defenses were too thin. He spread out all throughout Europe and, and North Africa. And uh, to go and take troops away from those different fronts would have been very difficult. He, his numbers were, were, you know, were not as good 
as he wanted them to be when it comes to the, the strength of his army. Um, and then the more territory he took, took over, the more he had to protect that territory. So he felt like we're going to try to get uh, Britain by the air, air in an air war. And then, then later on, you know, we'll build up our defenses. That was his plan. So basically was in this battle was Air Force versus Air Force. It was the Luftwaffe versus the Royal Air Force. And the Royal Air Force did a phenomenal job. The other thing that really helped out the Royal Air Force was the invention of radar. Um, so they knew when and where the uh, Luftwaffe were attacking and they were able to get people away from those areas so that the death toll wouldn't be too high. Because if the death toll were to get too high, then you would get Great Britain to surrender. Um, however, you know, it was uh, Churchill who had other plans. Churchill was going to make sure that everybody knew that no matter what happened, that the British would never surrender. Uh, and he even uh, said that in a speech that I'll talk about in a second here. But here's a political cartoon. It says here, uh, a Hitler, like Hitler is, is represented by, is, he's a, a dentist. And you have in his waiting room, the hats of all the different people that uh, he had taken care of. I guess you could say Czechoslovakia, Austria, Poland, Denmark, Norway, Holland, Belgium, France, and now Britain is next. And you see here that Churchill, the bulldog, has a little surprise for Hitler. Uh, in, in probably his most well-known and famous speech, Churchill, Churchill's finest hour speech really rallied the British people. And uh, in, in this speech, he said that they're never going to surrender, basically. He said, let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will say this was their finest hour. Meaning, you know, they want people thousands of years now look back and go Britain's finest hour was when they fought off the Germans. Um, and, and certainly uh, there's a case that could be made an argument that could be made for that definitely. But the, the uh, blitz, the London blitz that happened was, was pretty devastating. And it looked like, you know, after it was over that a nuclear blast had, had gone off in that, in that country. Uh, but they, they did not surrender. And that was, really comforting for Americans. In the United States, there's, there's big uh, arguments going on between pro-war and anti-war people. As, as you know, you know, and the same thing happens the, this day and age, whenever we're threatened by war, you have your pro-war and anti-war people who are speaking out. Those who supported helping the British form the Committee to Defend America by aiding the Allies. So defend America by aiding the allies, meaning help out the British as much as you possibly can, because if the British surrender and lose, then we're going to be next. Um, but then there's those who wanted to continue their stance with isolationism, including Charles Lindbergh, who, as I've said before, was an, an admirer of Adolf Hitler. Uh, they formed the America First Committee, meaning, you know, take care of us first and don't worry about other countries, isolationism. So, you know, these two sides clashed. On the uh, side of pro-war, here's a pro-war advertisement, of a poster that says defend American freedom. It's everybody's job. And basically Uncle Sam's putting down his party hat and putting on his work hat. More uh, propaganda, it says Americans suffer when careless talk kills and loose lips might sink ships. Basically, telling people to not speak negatively about the war effort, because if you do, um, the government's going to hesitate to send people over and people might die because of it. America first. Okay, so uh, once again, this is, I, I, t I told you earlier about cash and carry. One way that Roosevelt got help to the countries that he wanted to help, and then he didn't help the ones that he knew wouldn't be on our side, meaning the Germans. Here's another uh, piece of legislation that was passed, signed by Roosevelt. It's called Destroyers for Bases. Uh, Britain needed destroyers, ships. Uh, and on September 2nd, 1940, FDR transferred 50 old model four funnel destroyers left over from World War I in return for bases that the Americans used. Most of them they didn't use. Destroyers for Bases was Roosevelt's way 
of helping the British out without freaking the public out. And what I mean by that is a lot of the public, when they heard that Roosevelt was giving destroyers to Britain, said, you're getting this involved in the war. What are you doing? I can't believe you're doing this. And they started freaking out. Um, but then he always had, could be, could say publicly, no, we're not doing this to help out the British. We're doing this to get use of these bases that we desperately need. It's not for the, to help them. It's with the bases. So it, it was just his out, so to speak, his way to cover up the fact that he was helping who he needed to help. He didn't want to see the British lose because we'd be going at it alone. There's the destroyers, and there's a list of the bases that we eventually gave back to the British after the war was over. Okay, so, you know, in the, in the, during a war, once again, and, and even though we're not in the war yet in 1940, man, war is looming. It's looking like we're getting close. Um, Americans were really uh, concerned, uh, and, and they were comfortable with FDR. After all, in 1940, the depression was over. There, were, there was jobs to be had from all these factories that, that needed workers. So the unemployment was almost nothing in 1940. Americans had officially emerged from the depression in 1940. Why? Because of mobilization for the war. By the end of 1940, you know, again, you're either working in a factory or you're in the military. Remember, there's a draft that started in uh, September of 1940, the, the one and only peacetime draft in history. So anybody out there who's unemployed is now in the military. So, you know, it's over. So Americans are going to vote their pocketbook, and they're also going to vote for the person that, that they feel has helped them and that they're very comfortable with. And he's been president for eight years. But here's the thing. There's a two-term tradition out there that was established by Washington uh, the first president of the United States, he said, there's a tradition that we want rotation in office. We don't want someone getting too comfortable in there and getting too powerful. Um, so there's always, there's no law at this point. There is now that there, there wasn't at the time. So Roosevelt ran and won. And really he, he shattered the, uh, the two-term tradition, first president ever to go more than two terms. So he's here in this political cartoon here, he's, he knocked down Hoover in 32, landed in 36, and here's Wilkie. There's George Washington, not too happy, says no third term tradition, and he's about to knock him over too. And by the way, he'll knock over a fourth later on um, in 1944. Um, so yeah, he's going to be elected four times, and he would have been president for 16 years had he not died early in his fourth term. And then once, once that happened, once he was elected, all this whole hiding behind, we're going to help out who we help out, but, you know, anybody could get our help and not freaking out the public, that, that all went out the window with Lend-Lease. Lend-Lease was our way of helping the British out. And at this point, Roosevelt's like, this is what we're doing. Deal with it. We're, we're helping the British. It basically said this, the U.S. agreed to lend or lease arms to any democratic country whose defense was vital to the defense of the United States. I repeat, the U.S. agreed to lend or to lease arms. This is now weapons. This is not only cloth clothing and food. To any democratic country whose defense is vital to the defense of the United States. And at this point, that includes one country and one country only, the British. Because it, you'd say the, the, eventually it will extend to the Russians. But at this point, the Russians have a non-aggression pact with Germany. And you might also say they're not a democratic country, they're a communist country, but they would claim they're democratic. Anyway, we, we will help them out though. And he basically came out and said this, America would be the arsenal of democracy. Very Wilsonian right there, a Wilsonian idealism. We're gonna be an arsenal as weapons of, for, of any democratic country. We're gonna help them out. And he gave an interesting analogy. If your neighbor's house was on fire, wouldn't you allow him to use your hose to extinguish the fire? Point being that if you didn't do that, that fire may get over to your house and it might burn your house down too. So basically this is an unofficial declaration of war on Germany, Lend-Lease. No more hiding behind these different acts. But the United States went into wartime production and again, the depression is over. Here's when Americans were really took a, you know, a collective sigh of relief here 
after Hitler's violation of the non-aggression pact, June 22nd, 1941, Hitler couldn't help himself. He violated the non-aggression pact by attacking Russia. Um, he, he uh, you know, felt like the reason that he attacked Russia was to get the grain and oil out there that he so desperately felt he needed to win the war. Again, his army is so large now and spread out and he has so many tanks and planes that, and he needs oil and he needs food for this army. So Hit, Hitler decides that the place that he can get it is Russia. So he turned on, on uh, Stalin and he attacked Russia. And uh, you know, he gets bogged down from weather and whatnot. But at this point, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this as Americans collective sigh of relief because now the, the Russians are gonna be on the side of the allies and they're not gonna be allied with the, um, with the Germans. So political cartoon, forgive me comrade, but it seems such a good opportunity and you can see he's got a knife in his back. And the, the uh, Russians are going to fight bravely in Stalingrad, and they're going to hold off the Germans um, in some nasty fighting, millions of deaths, horrible weather, big mistake on uh, on uh, you know big mistake on on Hitler's part. Things are starting to crumble at this point. You could see here how cold it was in the winter, and it, how it bogged down the tanks. They couldn't. They wouldn't run in that cold weather. So it's getting closer and closer to Americans getting involved in this thing. But still, at this point, the majority of Americans were like, nope, we want to stay out of this war. But Roosevelt felt the need to meet with Churchill, Winston Churchill, um, to you know, urge him not to give up one. I believe that at this agreement, this meeting that they had known as the Atlantic Charter, it was uh, on a destroyer off the coast of Newfoundland. They, the two of them met. I believe that Roosevelt told Churchill, look, I don't know when or how we're going to get involved in this thing, but I'm pretty sure at some point we will. Hold out. Don't surrender. Keep fighting. We'll keep supplying you with weapons. And if something happens, we'll be there to help you. And I'm, I'm sure he told him that. There's no doubt in my mind that these two uh, talked about that. They discussed Wilson's 14 points, how, how viable those 14 points were and are, how they need to bring them up. They talked about how ridiculous that the League of Nations is and how it's worthless that they, their talks became the basis for the future United Nations that's going to be started. And America is going to get involved in that. So it was pretty productive uh, discussions on board the ship. Now, you might say, why were they on a ship off the coast of Newfoundland, neutral territory? Roosevelt still, at this point, felt like if he didn't want to go to Great Britain, plus it would have been very dangerous for him to do that. Um, he didn't want Churchill to come to Washington, D.C. because it, of the looks, the optics, right? It would look like we are getting involved in the war. And so he said, neutral territory, neutral ground, on a destroyer off the coast of Newfoundland. They talked. He told them to hold out. They talked about the future United Nations, paving the way for the future. And here you go, Lady Liberty handing the torch over to the two of them. And you see the hand coming out of the water. It says Europe in shackles. And then this happened, the attack on Pearl Harbor. The, the switch was flipped. It was December 7th, 1941, and the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in, in uh, Hawaii. Hawaii was not a state at this time. It was our territory. We owned it. We had ships there. Um, many battleships were sunk, killing over 3,000 men. And then the next day, Roosevelt gave a speech where he declared war on Japan and on Germany. He called it a date that will live in infamy. December 7th, 1941, by the night, that night, December 7th, 1941, all of America was all in and we were going to war. Here's the Japanese firepower there. They had two battleships, six carriers, 
eight destroyers, three cruisers, three subs, and 360 carrier base aircraft that were on board these carriers. And they launched them um, and they totally surprised Pearl Harbor at a little after 7 a.m. <clears throat> on a Sunday morning in December when the night before most of the military personnel was had Christmas parties and they're, you know, they didn't expect this to happen. Damage at Pearl Harbor in the first attack, the Japanese sunk the Arizona, the Oklahoma, the West Virginia, and the California. In two hours, 18 warships, 188 aircraft, 2,403 servicemen were lost in the attack. <clears throat> All ships except the Arizona, Utah, and Oklahoma were salvaged and saw action. The Japanese lost or had damaged 103 planes in the attack. And there's a, a Japanese Zero, one of the ones that was used there. And there is the uh, Arizona. It sits at the bottom of Pearl Harbor today. You could see how the chip ships were situated. Here's where the Arizona was and when it got hit. And there, there it's, it's where it still is. The Oklahoma was, the blast was so, um, violent that it flipped over the, the ship totally flipped over and here it is right here that's the oklahoma and this hole right here is a hole that they had to drill to get troops out of the bottom of the ship that they were in the hole down there and they were pounding to try to get out and they they drilled the hole to get them out and you could see the overturned hole right here you could see all the smoke from the attack you could see how thick the oil is in the water. Men were jumping into the water to get away from the fire and they were jumping into burning hot um, oil and it was just totally taking off all their skin and they would die. After this was all, everything was over, you could see how thick the oil is and how destroyed these ships are. The first thing that the Japanese did is they bombed the, the airstrip where all the, the Americans had all their airplanes um, lined up with the wings up so they could store more of them right along the on the tarmac. And the Japanese came in and, and bombed them first just so they wouldn't be able to launch airplanes to try to stop the attack. And it was successful. Americans did eventually get airplanes up, but it took a long time and there was a big delay. And there's a midget sub. Uh, that ran aground at Pearl Harbor and the captain or the lieutenant became the first Japanese POW. And that's the end of chapter 33. Chapter 34 gets into the war as we declared war on December 8th, 1941.